fairness and diversity. He's held distinguished fellowships in food studies at the University of Toronto and University of Melbourne and several other, it's quite a good list. So I'm very excited to hear and thank you so much for being here with us tonight. And so now I'm gonna let Hannah talk a little bit about the process of making the permits. So take it away. That's sure. Um, so the Culinary Diplomacy Club helped out with this event by making um, five fermented recipes, uh, three of which were supplied from Dara's book, um, a couple of which came from other sources. Um, we wanted to uh, have a variety of countries' cuisines represented. Um, so we had, um, from Dara's book, we made um, fermented oatmeal, uh, rind tomatoes, and uh, fermented carrots with, oh no, sorry, that's not from your book. Um, the kvass. Uh, the kvass, thank you. <laughs> and raspberry kvass, which is the, the drink that you sample. Um, and uh, from those are all uh, Russian in origin. And then the other uh, recipes that we made were our Ukrainian recipe for fermented carrots with caraway and um, coriander and uh, a borscht recipe, which is a Romanian recipe for a fermented uh, soup base. Basically it's used in, uh, to add flavor with the soup. And um, the last one, Ajika. Thank you so much. <laughs> the last one was uh, Ajika, which is a Georgian spicy pepper relish. Um, so I made some of those. Um, other culinary diplomacy members, uh, David Lander and Trishy Jindal, made some of those. Um, so I hope you guys enjoyed. It was a really um, my first time fermenting, so it was a really fun and interesting experience. Like the actual hands-on cooking part was very, very low effort. Um, maybe just like half an hour of work tops so and then you kind of put things away and let them sit for a few days and this sort of magic happens um, that the flavor changes and you get something different than what you put in. Um, so I really enjoyed it. Um, I'll be doing more of it in the future. I hope you guys are, you know, brave and want to try it too and want to try some of Dara's recipes. And, um, and it's a great way to, a lot of the recipes that are very kind of like sustainably minded as well and that they're using things that maybe you wouldn't eat as they are, um, but it's turning them into something else that is really tasty and that you can um, that you can use down the line and save for a long time. So that's all I have to say. Thanks very much. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Now, so if you could please welcome me in introducing, or give a round of applause for Dara Goldstein and the food we have tasted tonight. Those are her recipes. Thank you so much for inviting me. I don't know if you know the background, but the invitation came three years ago, I think, uh, just before the pandemic. And I have been in a cycle of communications, I think with three different classes of yes. students to try and get here. And as I was driving here, I kept thinking, oh, there's gonna be an accident, you know, some <laughs> disaster is gonna happen because maybe I'm not fated to come to the Fletcher School, but I am here and really happy to be here. Um, I think you guys did an awesome job with the ferments. Uh, they tasted really good to me. And how many of you are familiar with fermenting at home? <laughs> oh, so a good number. So um, I think when you talk to Americans writ large and you talk about pickles, um, they think about vinegar as the preservative. And vinegar is an excellent preservative and uh, vinegar preserved pickles taste really good. You have that nice sharp <clears throat> zing, but they, it doesn't have the health benefits of fermentation. When you ferment things, basically you're just using salt. Sometimes you don't even have to use salt, um, but you're letting um, the good microbes come to the surface and get rid, get rid of the bad microbes. And it's um, a process of creating lactic acid. And it's what we today call um, probiotics. Obviously in the Slavic world, which is what I'm primarily talking about in you know, Russia more so than other places, but um, the peasants did not know about probiotics by name, but they knew what they liked and they knew what made them feel healthy. And if they did not have their sourdough rye bread, then 
it was no good. And even someone like Pushkin, you know, who grew up in this very rarefied, Europeanized, Westernized environment, he wrote some uh, letters back from one of his sojourns in Paris, and he's saying, yeah, it's okay here, but there's no black bread. There's nothing to eat. You know, it's that taste of the sour and um, the sense that that's what makes you healthy is to have that. If you think about uh, the whole amazing repertoire of Russian soups, um, you might think of borscht, which is really Ukrainian, um, but then you, uh, the national Russian soup is xi, which is a sauerkraut soup where you can make this sort of lazy xi, which is made with fresh cabbage that hasn't been fermented, but it doesn't have the same healthful qualities. You have a soup like rasolnik, which uses the fermented brine from having made pickles. You have um, a kroshka. How many of you have had that? It's an amazing um, summer soup where it's just like chopping up a salad in a bowl and then you pour kvass, the kvass that's made from grain. I suppose you could try with the raspberry kvass and see how it turns out. But um, And there are, are many others. If you think about um, the whole tradition of dairy culture in Russia as well, you have cultured butter, you have smitana, you know, which is sour cream. You have tvarok, you know, which is also uh, soured milk, basically. Um, and you have a whole range of things like prastakvasha, which is yogurt-like, and many, many others. If there is a trinity in Russia, besides the religious one, it would be vodka, of course, which is, uh, you know, you don't have a meal without it, basically. Vodka, black bread, and pickles. And all three of those are the products of fermentation. Mm -hmm. So to make vodka, you get a fermented mash of grain, and then you distill it. The pickles have been cured with the brine, and the bread has the sourdough. So um, when you ferment, it's usually a, a three to 5% salt solution. You can also just do what is called a dry uh, ferment, uh, which is what I usually do when I make sauerkraut. And you just take the shredded cabbage and you uh, sprinkle salt on the cabbage and then you take your hands. This is the wonderful part of it. You just massage with your hands to break down the cell structure of the cabbage so that it starts giving off moisture. And you let it ferment for about two weeks. And that is nastayashche kvashnaya kapusta. But there's also kislaya kapusta, which you can make in just two days, two to three days. And that uses um, a probably like a, a three and a half percent brine, and you just let the cabbage sit for a few days, it ferments lightly, and it has a, a fresher, less intense flavor. Um, Russian culinary practice has uh, yet another form of fermentation that is called machinia. And that is uh, not really, translatable into English, you can call it sousing, <laughs> which is a weird word, or I tend to call it brining. And uh, it uses a much uh, lower percentage of salt. Usually it's just about 3% salt, and it's used with fruits, which are much more delicate. So the classic Russian um, brined food is uh, mm -hmm. how many of you have had um, and they take the Antonovka apple which is a really sour crisp apple and they put it in this light brine and let it sit for six months to a year it comes out all wizened because you know it's moisture has been coming out of it, but it tastes almost like wine. There is a recipe for it in the Beyond the North Wind. Um, it's done with berries, and uh, it can be done with watermelon, which is really one of my favorite things to do in the summer. 
on his deathbed, Pushkin's last words, and I am not making this up, but, you know, give me brined cloudberries. They're really beautiful. So um, fermentation is just uh, something without which uh, people in the Slavic world cannot do, and it is what makes them feel healthy, and in fact, it is very, very good for you. Um, besides kvass, that's the uh, sort of or Russian drink. It is uh, the traditional kind is made with grain, and you allow the grains to ferment. Um, it, you can do it with wheat berries, you can do it with rye, you can do it with a mixture. But um, they also have a very long tradition of mead, which is uh, fermenting honey. And that um, is the uh, monks in monasteries were very famous for the mead that they made and they did a lot of fruit meads. Um, there was also, you don't find it so much anymore, but Biriozovica, which is fermented birch sap. So if you tap your trees, you know, here we tap maples, but if you tap birch, you get this beautiful um, clear sap that uh, has a little bit of a winterberry taste. And you let that, you can drink it fresh, which is really lovely, but you can also let it ferment. And then they have the craziest one that um, you were just asking me about the samovar, you know, it's been bothering you since middle school. The phrase in Russian that bothered me until I really started getting into a serious diet of Russian food was this kisli shi. So kisli means sour. So kisli kapusta. And shi is the cabbage soup. And it's in Gogol because his characters are drinking it all the time. But um, there would be these passages, and of course I read it first in English, you know, um, for a nightcap, he'd have a, a bottle of pickles. And I'm like, no, you do not have a bottle of pickles. Um, first of all, it wouldn't be a bottle, it would be a jar, but you also don't have that many pickles before you lie down to eat. And it turns out that that is a name for um, a kvass-like drink that is more effervescent, more sparkly. The aristocracy liked it. It uses malted grains. So there's uh, a little bit of sweetness to it because you malt the grains before you ferment them further. And it's called a uh, sour cabbage soup, but it's actually a sparkling champagne-like drink. And there's recipe for that in there. That one was a struggle. Um, so I really encourage you to think about fermentation as not something that is uh, at all scary. Um, it can go bad when you're making something. You never know exactly how it will turn out. So much depends on the ambient temperature in the room. Um, it often forms a little bit of uh, white mold on the surface, which is not dangerous. You just scrape it off. But if you're very mold diverse, then that might be a problem for you um, until you get more used to it. Um, if you see black mold, then you want to throw it out. But I think only once in my life have I um, really seen the black mold, and that usually doesn't happen. So I encourage all of you to try it. Um, I was trying to think of some very clever way to segue into <laughs> culinary diplomacy, because you want me to talk about both things. I'm like, well, ideas fermenting and, you know, people talking, and I decide that really... I mean, was stretching things. <laughs> so I'm just going to move to culinary diplomacy, and then we'll have a Q&A time, and we can maybe one of you will think of a, a brilliant connector. Um, <clears throat> it's really wonderful to know that you have a culinary diplomacy club here. I think that is so important. When you think about the English word companion, you know, a friend, so what is the root of companion? It's Latin. Well, think of co. What? Don't be shy. Someone who you share your bread with. Exactly. So com or co, that's with, you know, together. And 
pane, panis is bread. So whoever you break bread with becomes your companion. And in many cultures, I mean, Arabic particularly, um, mm -hmm. once you have, well, ostensibly, once you have uh, broken bread with someone, that person can no longer be your enemy. So it's a very immediate and profound um, idea. This commensality, which means, comes from the word for table. So together at the table, it's the sharing of a meal. And um, it shouldn't be taken lightly. It is, uh, food is a universal language. You don't have the same language barriers that you have, you know, with the spoken language because the food isn't logocentric. You know, you can uh, share something even if you don't know the name of what it's called. And it's a really immediate way to enter into another culture. So um, we talk about culinary diplomacy. There's um, a slightly more current term now, which is gastro diplomacy. In a way, they're pretty much the same. I would say that the difference is that culinary diplomacy um, still has that air of um, diplomacy that is practiced by state actors, okay? Diplomats, um, people in uh, professional positions. Whereas gastro diplomacy is more uh, widely embracing and it can be practiced by citizens. I mean, citizens can do culinary diplomacy too, but it just um, is a, a, a less formal term, I would say. And interestingly, I was kind of excited as I was thinking about my comments for tonight. Um, a friend sent me this, because I don't usually look at dictionary.com to see what the word of the day is. But on October 6th, the word of the day was gastro diplomacy. And I thought, wow, you know, it has arrived, um, or at least is on its way to arriving and being mainstreamed if it's um, presented that way. It was actually a term that was coined only in 2002 by The Economist magazine. And they were writing about um, an initiative in Thailand where the government decided that one way to get people to come to Thailand or more be more aware of Thailand was, was to promote um, Thai cuisine abroad. And this wasn't a new idea. In fact, um, in 1938, there was a military coup and um, Fibun, and I'm not gonna remember the second half of his name, but um, he uh, became prime minister. And one of his first acts to try and unify the country mm -hmm. and to create this idea of Thai-ness was to create a new national food and then to promote that. And the food that he created, the national dish that he created was, what do you think it was? Pad Thai. And Pad Thai, its entire name actually means um, rice noodles done in the Chinese style. Pad Thai is not uh, a, a native Thai dish. The rice noodles were brought to what was then Siam by Chinese immigrants. And then it was, Thaiified, <laughs> Thaianized, it was made Thai um, by the addition of tamarind and chilies and um, a, a flavor and sweetened because uh, palm sugar because the Thai uh, like their food sweeter than most Chinese. And it became um, the, the symbol of Thailand that was promoted throughout the the world and everyone sort of knows pad thai even if they can't think of another dish. So in 2002, the government decided to um, make a push to open Thai restaurants throughout the world. And that was this uh, Thai global initiative um, that the economists mentioned. In 2012, the American government got in on the act 
and created the American Culinary Corps, which was 80 chefs who were sent on actual diplomatic missions to you know, different countries throughout the world to um, showcase American food and American wine. And this was, again, in the context of uh, state dinners or consular dinners, you know, official things. So it, it wasn't people to people. Um, some of the ways in which, uh, if you don't want government edict to say, this will be our national dish, you know, how else can you brand your nation through food? What do you think some of the other possibilities might be? I guess without coming up with a new recipe, what do you think a recipe more accessible or more codified of like this is, I don't know, I guess, all of the examples, like, I'm thinking of like ramen in Japan, I guess, is like that's Japanese food, even though that's technically from China, but they've kind of pulled it together to be like, when you think of ramen, you think of Japan. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so so choosing a food, I would say that, um, what do people think of when they think of American food? Burgers. Burgers, you know. I mean, you can quibble with what is chosen and we can say, that isn't, you know, the wide range of American food. But the important word that you use was codify. So the French were really the savvy ones in the 19th century. They had um, the great uh, early 19th century chef Carême, who codified French cuisine through his cookbooks. And then Escoffier, another great chef at the end of the 19th century actually you know, made a book that told you exactly how every sauce had to be made. So it was codified and that was French haute cuisine. And as you know, until the late 20th century, uh, French food was dominant as the, you know, ne plus ultra, you know, uh, French cuisine until the Spaniards, you know, <laughs> sort of wiped them off the table. So codifying the cuisine is um, really important. And you can do that through cookbooks. When Italy was unified in uh, 1861, because there was so many different, well, uh, duchies and really different countries, there was a man named uh, Pellegrino Artusi who wrote a cookbook called um, um, The Science, I'm gonna get the name a little bit wrong, uh, Science in the Kitchen and the Art of Eating Well. And he published that in 1891, and that created, you know, Italian, unified Italian cuisine. And yes, there are regional recipes, but it was all part of this larger Italy. And in more recent times, we can look at chefs and restaurateurs. In 2004, Klaus Meyer, um, a Danish um, restaurateur, entrepreneur and Rene Redzepi got together and they published the Nordic Kitchen Manifesto. And they're very uh, aware of how to brand things, how to sell things. And it went, even though we didn't say it in those days, it went viral. And the idea was uh, looking, even though uh, Red Seppi was from Macedonia, okay, <laughs> he wasn't Danish, but looking at what the place you are from has in terms of its indigenous ingredients, um, not necessarily allowing anything else in, thinking about sustainability, they were early thinkers about that and about social equity and labor issues. And it was a blueprint for the future. And it just, people went wild and Red Seppi opened Noma restaurant and the new Nordic cuisine happened and it became the hot uh, cuisine or the hot style. Um, you know, now it has waned, but for probably a good 20 years. So all of these are mechanisms wh whereby um, cuisine can be broadcast into the world. And that all sounds pretty good on a certain level. I first got involved even before the term um, 
I guess it was just after gastro diplomacy was coined. But in the early 2000s, the Council of Europe invited me to be part of a um, international working group to look at ways in which food could be used to promote tolerance and diversity. And um, it was me and someone from Ireland, a couple of people from France, one from Germany, one from Israel. I think there were six of us. And we talked, it was um, in preparation for the 50th anniversary of the signing of the European Cultural Convention. And the idea was to publish this volume that would uh, showcase the um, specific cultures of each country that had been signatory to this convention and uh, show that they were all unified as you know part of the Council of Europe. And it was a really wonderful project. And that book um, that I edited came out in 2005, but it wasn't quite so simple. Um, we invited uh, each uh, through the embassies in each country, we invited them to find someone who could write the entry. And um, starting with the A's, you know, so Armenia found this amazing woman who was a PhD anthropologist and she wrote an extraordinary essay about Armenian food. And Azerbaijan in invited the head of um, a culinary school to write that entry. And unfortunately, that entry was not very substantive and it wasn't very good. And it ended up, um, we filled a lot of pages with images, and it ended up that Azerbaijan had nine pages and Armenia had 13 pages. And Azerbaijan filed a formal complaint with the Council of Europe, accused Armenia of appropriating um, Azeri food because all of Armenian food was really from Azerbaijan. And you know, there was this big, um, there was distress because food is so important a part of identity. And, you know, that was a scuffle that we can sort of laugh at and say, oh, that is so silly. But in fact, it, um, there are ongoing battles about who owns what food. And it used to be that food was seen as, you know, a commonality. I mean, like we all should eat this food and we all should enjoy it. And maybe we eat in our own way. We don't eat certain foods because of religious or health, you know, or cultural proscriptions, but it's still, you know, sort of uh, a universal patrimony. And uh, probably hummus is the prime example of how um, heated and how deep these arguments go. So hummus is, universal throughout the Middle East. It probably originated in Egypt, but from Egypt, you know, by the 13th century, it had moved, you know, throughout that part of the world and each country was making it in its own way. Um, you know, with more or less tahini, you know, with garlic, with lemon, you know, however. And then um, after, Israel became a state, people experienced, I mean, it was a lot of Ashkenazi Jews with, um, who were eating, you know, um, fermented <laughs> foods in the style of what we just had tonight. And they tasted hummus and they're like, wow, this is really good. And it became an absolute favorite in Israel. And being entrepreneurial, um, Israelis, um, made it more public. And how many of you, um, I was just talking to someone who said, you know, no time for cooking as a graduate student, you know, you just have to grab something. So how many of you have had Sabra hummus that, you know, okay, it's ubiquitous. It's an Israeli company. Sabra being, you know, the, uh, the person from Israel who is from the land. Um, Falafel King, you have one in Boston. How many of you have eaten there? Okay, well, falafel is pretty good. <laughs> but um, early on, uh, the Falafel King outlets had Israeli flags. 
So it was branding this food as Israeli when it's pan Middle Eastern. And there was understandably a lot of anger. You know, first they stole our land and now they're stealing our food. And also in uh, Lebanon, there was a lot of anger. And we can talk about Ivar. How many of you know Ivar? Um, Ivar is the uh, concentrated red pepper paste that you find in the Balkans. So who made it first? Well, the red peppers and the sunflower oil that's usually used came from the new world. So it wasn't like a very ancient dish, but the way they make it in a certain town in Serbia is considered maybe the best if you're from that certain town in Serbia. But if you're from Macedonia um, and you add eggplant to yours, that's the best. So there are all these battles over that and it's really complicated. One thing that uh, tried to help it, I would say, and maybe ended up hurting it in a certain way is UNESCO and their um, program of the intangible cultural heritage, which has been going on for decades. And it's a wonderful thing. And it looks at um, traditions that are so deeply rooted in a culture that they deserve to be recognized as much as a building that is, you know, some feat of beauty or engineering. So the first cuisine to be added to the list of um, intangible cultural heritage were French, the French gastronomic meal, not just the French meal, the French gastronomic meal, and the traditional cuisine of Mexico. And any of you who have been to Mexico know that there is not a traditional cuisine because it's very regional. But anyway, both of those were inducted in 2010. Um, the baguette just made it in in 2022 because it's endangered. <laughs> uh, it's coming back. But um, there was actually a great diplomatic coup in 2021 when there was a cross-border induction between uh, with both Poland and Belarus together for um, tree beekeeping in both countries. Um, tree beekeeping is, you know, um, trees in the forest where there are wild hives and, and the traditions of gathering the honey, which is how it always used to be. And then there's also, uh, do you know about the Slow Food Foundation? So they have an arc of taste that they again induct these foods um, and culinary traditions that are in danger of being lost. And they put them in this arc to protect them and hope that by documenting them, the techniques won't be lost. And again, there is um, upset when some country gets in or some tradition does and another one doesn't. And after um, Russia invaded Ukraine, there was an um, emergency application for borscht to be inducted as part of the intangible culinary heritage. And UNESCO called it a case an application of extreme urgency and acted on it immediately so that um, it would be inducted and it was in, uh, see, I, I think 2022 or it might have been a little bit earlier to recognize it. And that was a political statement, very much so. So um, a friend of mine who teaches at NYU, Fabio Parasicoli, um, coined this other term, gastronativism, which really refers to the use of food for ideological purposes and how food can be used instead of bringing people in and together at the table to exclude. Um, he's Italian and Actually, a lot of this happened in Italy starting in 2009. Many of the small towns um, created bans against, because uh, there were a lot of immigrants from Turkey and um, from the Middle East, and they were setting up kebab shops and uh, serving ethnic food or foreign food. And the towns were aghast because they felt that Italian, you know, the grand Italian cuisine, which of course itself, only had been codified, 
a um, hundred years earlier, it, they felt it was being watered down. And so these people were banned from having uh, food shops in the center of the historic centers of the city. And even in Denmark, where we think about it as a very progressive country, um, the this very right-wing anti-immigrant uh, party, I think it's the Danish People's Party, I can't quite remember the name now, they, uh, had a huge protest because people, um, hospitals and schools were serving halal meatballs and Denmark's all about pork. So um, you can have all this culinary diplomacy, this gastro diplomacy, this goodwill. In 2008, um, the Israeli Arian Adler, whom I'd been working with in the Council of Europe, um, he had founded the Center for Diplomacy and uh, Peace in, um, at Tel Aviv University. He invited me to come to Israel and introduced me to this young Druze scholar. Um, and we started this project to bring uh, Israeli Jews and Israeli Arabs together through the table. And the idea was it would, it would be contact theory. Um, once you have contact between uh, different groups of people, they inevitably can be brought around to understand different points of view. And we limited it to women and children because we knew that they would be more open to it. But, you know, it was grassroots. It was this idealism that, oh, we can solve the problems of the Middle East, you know. But until... Um, governments actually get behind things and legislate and make sure that people feel um, heard and equal, you know, all of the best intentions, they're, they're worthwhile and it does open people's minds and it's really important, but it's not going to affect the kind of change that we want to see. I mean, as we're seeing, of course, um, at this point in the world, so as future diplomats or people who are um, going out into public service, I think that the most important thing you can do, um, or one of the most important things you can do is try to understand people through their palate. Um, find out about not just you know the great gastronomy, the haute cuisine, but also the street food. Find out, um, ways, uh, learn what organizations there are so that you can engage in a kind of soft diplomacy, even when the hard, you know, power talks aren't working, but also have those conversations about ownership of food and really try to understand why people feel that they own that food and then it, and that it's theirs. Um, the question of identity is really real. And the idea of culinary appropriation as cultural appropriation is also real. But when you're talking about recipes, it's extremely problematic because foods have been traveling throughout the world for centuries. And people, whether by personal inclination or forced uh, migration have also been traveling. And as soon as they move to a new place, whether they've been uprooted or done it by choice, they encounter new ingredients, but they still want to make the food that is theirs and still have that connection with their own either uh, national identity, religious identity, personal identity, and that food changes. And that doesn't mean it's any less authentic, and it doesn't necessarily mean that they have appropriated it from someone else. The whole idea about recipes is that they evolve. So it's a, a complicated uh, dance that you have to do there. And I think on the metaphor of dance, it's a good place to stop the formal comments and see if you have any questions. First 
I'll, I'll, I'll do the first one so it'll give people time to think because I know how that usually goes. <laughs> so I guess you brought up a lot of really interesting points. And I think something that comes up when I've had like conversations with people from other cultures and other food backgrounds is we often talk about like how to make it so that, how to say this? So people have different palates. And so it's how do you introduce foods to people when their palates are different and they don't initially like it? A lot of people will grow to like certain foods, but how do you, do you like modify recipes in that case? Or do you just have the conversation of like why our foods are different or how do you uh -huh. cross that barrier? When you say you, is it um, me or is it one? Well, that's difficult. Yeah. So I guess this is because I had two different answers. Fair. I think my personal example, I lived in Japan and I didn't like the food very much at first, but then I really grew to like it after like more explanation of where it came from and the introduction to the culture. And then I also started eating like red bean sweets and a lot of things that initially I thought were like, that's kind of weird from my American mm -hmm. background. So, well, I think, um, I mean, my whole thing is, is food history it's the world on a plate. So you're served anything, anything at all. And there is enormous history in front of you. And even if you're not interested in so much flavors and recipes and things, you can think about labor issues. Like, you know, I just had a glass of, uh, a cup of tea and um, I could start thinking about how tea you know, migrated from China and entered into Western culture, all of the traditions around tea. I can think about the backbreaking work of the women who are picking the tea. I can think about traditions of fermentation um, and fermenting it into a dark black tea or having green tea. So you can, that's the wonderful thing about um, working with food is you can enter into it from, you can think about the Japanese tea ceremony and how many layers of aesthetics and uh, beauty and all of the material culture that goes with it too. I mean, it's just extraordinary. So I think the more you know about the background of what's on your plate, the more um, open you will be to tasting it and in a way it doesn't really matter if you like it because so much is culturally determined if you haven't grown up eating you know a lot of the uh going back to the fer fermentation the natto mm -hmm. for instance really stinky really really heavily fermented food uh, you probably will go ooh, um and it's okay I would say just taste it, just give it the taste. So you can say, you know, I've tasted, I don't need to eat it again. Um, my own personal thing like that is sheep's eyeballs, <laughs> which, you know, I just, you, you eat it as a sign of honor. If you're the guest and it's the best thing that can be presented to you, that was in Armenia, but you don't um, necessarily have to embrace it. Did that answer your question? So yeah, and it's Dara. Well, thank you for a wonderful presentation, a very thoughtful uh, talk, and I uh, wish we had more Fletcher students here to witness it. But we'll be very happy to share the recording uh, with them. Uh, we started a, a conversation uh, during the dinner about your process for coming up with your uh, cookbooks and coming up with the recipes. And you mentioned during the uh, presentation the issue of cultural appropriation. So I wonder how you deal with that, uh, determining which recipes to put into a Russian cookbook, which to put into a Georgian cookbook, and so on and so uh -huh. forth. Um, those for me were pretty straightforward. Um, I think if you're writing a cookbook, the most important thing is um, to acknowledge the source. So I always have head notes. And um, if it came from a person who is willing to be named, because that's not always the case, um, then you can do that. If it came from like an adaptation of Malakovets, you know, this great 19th century Russian cookbook, um, or if it was just me having these Russian flavors in my mind um, and say, 
and I'm American and, you know, I'm making this in the Russian style. Um, I don't think that's appropriation. In Georgia, it was harder because I don't speak Georgian. I mean, I can go into a restaurant and order, that's my culinary Georgian. Um, but I, I can't converse with people. In those days, I could use Russian. So, you know, that was um, okay, but I still couldn't get nuances the way I like to. But I was very sensitive to um, the setting and the background of the family. I, I mean, these two new books are a different kind of thing. They're not like me, if you know what I mean. They're a project I'm working on, but they don't come from years of study. And so I don't give huge cultural context. But if you look at, you know, Beyond the North Wind or my Georgian feast, um, the first half of that book is about Georgian culture. So I feel like if you um, respect show respect and honor to the culture that you're writing about. Um, there should not be any accusation of appropriation. I think when that happens, it really is because there's an imbalance of power. So if you look at, say, Israel and, um, you know, the rest of the Middle East, the Israelis are making money off hummus. If you look at Russia and Ukraine, I mean, that's obvious too. Russia being uh, the dominant power in the region and the Ukraine Ukrainians, you know, um, feeling like their soup has been stolen from them. So think about um, getting people, yeah, I mean, easier said than done, right? <laughs> but if you can uh, acknowledge that, you know, there's a common basis in humanity um, it helps, even if it doesn't salt anything. On that line, I, I understand where this, you know, you're talking about imbalance of power, where this national pride comes from, but there are so many foods that you just find, you know, you take the dumpling, you know, piroshki and pierogan and piki ravioli and empanadas, you know, they're all kind of the same, I mean, with their own differences. How do you use that? Can you use that to bring people together? similarities in there? Ideally. I mean, you can say, um, you know, this is a dumpling like, but then um, ideally you would know uh, a comparison that would resonate for them. So, um, you know, if you have Kreplach, <laughs> you can say, oh, this is like, um, you know, uh, wonton soup or something. Um, so if you can find a sort of touchstone, I think it does help. Or the baked pirishki, you can say it is like an empanada, but just with a different filling. Oh, oh but you can duke it out. Okay. <laughs> ordinarily, um, <clears throat> ordinarily, cultural appropriation isn't funny, but I do always get a kick out of the fact that my favorite dish is British and they're not known for their cuisine. They took beef on croute and just slapped Wellington on it. <laughs> the, the beef Wellington, yeah. I, I, I saw that somewhere. And I really, I had no idea that it was obviously originally a French dish. Uh, and for political reasons, they just kind of- Yeah, opted. a general, you know, or admiral or a duke, a duke right. Yeah, I mean, if you go back, um, that's one of the difficult things about studying food is we all want the origin. And there's something that we refer to as fake lore because it is, <laughs> it's like the origin stories of so many of these foods are just wacko, um, but they're charming. And it's also narrative. And once you have narrative, then you remember things. And so, um, you know, you say that about the Buffon Crout, and I think, well, were the French really the first to do that? Yeah, so I would then go and do some research. But yes, um, certainly the English took it from the, the French um, and made it into something that does sound more glorious. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I have a question regarding your, I saw that you, you worked as a cultural envoy at Georgia for the State Department. 
and Georgians are very proud of their cuisine, the wine, the kinkalis. I was wondering, um, being a cultural envoy for the State Department in a country that's so proud of its, its gastronomy, how do you promote American culinary diplomacy? Oh, yeah, that was wild. I mean, it was even wilder. I, di I did it, I went to Turkmenistan. Um, and did it there too. And that was really strange. I'll tell you about that in a minute. But um, yeah, they, I mean, I think that's the hardest I ever worked ever because they had me doing like three events a day all across Georgia and the roads there are um, terrifying. But I wanted to talk. Um, I, I mean, I acknowledge I adore Georgian cuisine. I had written a a cookbook about it, but I wanted them to understand American, um, not really just the food, but um, eating culture, because I think that um, the other thing that makes a, a meal really meaningful is not just the food, but the way it's served. And so if you know Georgian culture, there's the supra, which is the feast, and you have the tamada, who's the toastmaster, and it's a long extended evening with lots of drinking and lots of beautiful toasts, but it's a way of, um, because the Georgians were overrun, you know, so many times and continue to be, I might add, um, with Russia occupying 20% of their country as we speak, um, as a way of affirming kinship and affirming the country. So it also had a kind of political purpose. So Americans don't, um, you know, we have Thanksgiving when family and friends gather and that is our sort of um, big communal meal, but it's all based on a lie, you know, the pilgrims and the Indians getting together and, you know, loving each other. So I just wanted to introduce them to I think the idea there wasn't all um, burgers and hot dogs and Coke and Pepsi and Fanta, um, and that there are all these really rich regional cuisines. And um, because there are so many different um, cultures in the United States, it used to be that the idea, kind of a culinary one, was that we were a melting pot. But um, I think that's evolved that we don't want everything to melt into the, the final stew where you don't taste the different elements. You still want the other elements distinct instead of just, you know, at least from my perspective, total assimilation is not necessarily the most desirable outcome. You still want distinctiveness and distinctive flavors. So yeah, I had PowerPoint presentations and, and talked about it. Um, when I was in Turkmenistan, I couldn't travel in the, you know, to the same degree. It was uh, very, very controlled. And um, but I did give a talk to a group of. Um, I'm not exactly sure who they were, but they were uh, journalists and um, people who were um, allowed to come into the embassy and. Um, speak with an American. And then it was written up in a newspaper the next day. <laughs> and it was so amazing because it started out, you know, she came all the way from the United States to talk about American culture, um, American food culture. And she started her comments by saying, um, the sun rises and the sun sets on our great leader. <laughs> you know, it's just like, you know, in Russia, when Lenin was alive, it was all you had to learn to uh, read between the lines. And so these were the words that were coming out of my mouth. I guess kind of on this topic that I've, this is all really interesting of when we talked to kind of about codifying food, what would you say are like American foods that were codified that you were introducing beyond burgers in these countries? Oh. Okay, so I um, talked about uh, New England and I talked about lobster rolls and fried clams. Um, I talked about New Orleans and um, gumbo. I talked about um, 
Tex-Mex food, you know, which is very distinct from Mexican food, you know, it's its own thing. So things like that. So really getting them thinking about the different regions and the different peoples. There's, there's a lot of times when uh, the food is kind of misrepresented on a global platform. Like, I, I think it's like domestic power dynamics. I'm not sure. But have you seen that around different countries? Like for India, it's usually the North Indian food that someone mis misrepresents when it's like so diverse around the country. Yeah, I think that um, one of the problems in America is that um, there, <laughs> boy, this is the understatement of the day. There isn't a lot of nuance <laughs> in anything um, and certainly not in food. So you get Chinese food, you get Indian food, you get Italian food, you know? And um, I think Italian food was one of the first to become more nuanced when people discovered pesto, Northern Italian food instead of Neapolitan red sauce and pizza. Um, and Chinese food was mostly Cantonese. And then in it was in the 1970s, um, Sichuan and Hunanese were discovered and they were hot and spicy and people got very excited. In India, um, again, I think that people, I've spent the most time in Kerala and really, really love the food there. And I, you know, you don't really find that here and people don't know the distinctions. But I think a lot of it is that um, the restaurant business is very, very difficult. And so I know that um, in Williamstown, an Indian restaurant, an Indian restaurant opened Spice, Spice Root, um, R-O-O-T. And for the first two weeks, it was fantastic and I was so excited. And then suddenly it no longer was because, you know, people were saying, oh, it's too spicy or this is too strange. And so they Americanized it. So I really think it's um, having to address the most common denominator so that your restaurant can survive. I don't think it is, um, I don't know how to get past that. Do you have any thoughts on the role that diasporas play in culinary diplomacy? Because you know, here in the United States, we have Italian food is very popular, uh, Indian food, you know, Chinese food, and so on and so forth. Uh, we don't really see much in terms of Eurasian uh, cuisines. Uh, you know, there are maybe a handful of restaurants, um, places like New York, uh, where there are, there are in fact large uh, Russian-speaking communities. Um, but uh, but. Other countries like uh, Germany, for example, Israel, plenty of uh, Eurasian cuisine. So um, perhaps you can just speak to, to that, how diasporas can carry uh, their cultures. Yeah, I mean, it, it's the way people um, really get to know a country if they don't travel to it. And also immigrants, um, it, for the most part has been a, a very standard way for immigrants to get a, a footing in this country. And they start with something small and um, people taste the food, but even Chinese food, you know, which now we don't even um, think of as Chinese in a way, you know what I mean? Um, it's just something we eat and it's been normalized. I guess you could say, um, as late as the 1950s, it was still seen as very, very strange. And um, it took a lot of, again, it was cookbooks. There was this whole series of cookbooks, how to cook and eat in Chinese, how to cook and eat in Russian. It's a really um, good one, all these different countries. So yeah, so there are a few Central Asian restaurants I know in DC, in New York. Um, uh, some Nepalese, uh, not that that's Eurasia, but again, that's not uh, mainstream yet. It really depends on um, having a large enough community so that you have enough customers from your own community to support it. And then it can extend out into the larger um, 
establish communities around you. Um, and I think it is finding that economic balance that's so crucial. But yeah, it's a good way to, unless you have the um, backing of the government of Thailand that is putting money into these initiatives and helping people open the restaurants and making sure that they can thrive. So that is one way to, to do it. Are there other examples of this kind of uh, government support that has been particularly successful? I mean, I heard recently that uh, Ukraine, in fact, was trying to uh, support uh, Ukrainian restaurants around the world. Um, they are, but I think that they don't really have very much money. Um, certainly in London, um, and I've forgotten the chef's name, but um, he's very involved with that. And in uh, 2020, the Ukrainian Institute, which is a quasi-governmental um, organization, published a a, actually a really beautiful cookbook um, online. Just go to Ukrainian Institute and um, it's a PDF and it's quite a large book and it has a whole section on culinary diplomacy. I wish they had let me edit the book because <laughs> <laughs> the language could be better, but um, it's presenting all of uh, these you know very ukrainian recipes to the world and in the introduction to it they very baldly state that it's a pr initiative um, to get people to understand ukraine and ukrainian food and to counter the isolation of the country so yeah um but i just don't think they have big uh you know you need big pockets to support restaurants As I remember, Japan uh, invested into promotion of sushi culture in Russia in early 2000s. But, oh. And uh, now sushi is everywhere. Yeah. <laughs> it's okay. uh, but uh, it's the beginning of 21st century in Russia. There were not too many places uh, to eat sushi. And uh, uh, Japanese embassy um, conducted some program uh, efforts. But uh, for me, it's strange because, um, you know, a lot of Russians love sushi. But if you ask them, so guys, you love sushi, maybe or you love sushi and anime uh, cartoons, uh, but uh, maybe you are going to solve the Kuril Islands uh, issue. No, the same, the same as the, towards uh, American efforts. I... I was invited a couple of times in uh, American consulate in Ekaterinburg, and uh, I, I saw people who ate a couple of tons of buffalo wings, but they, <laughs> um, but, uh, but they continued to, to be skeptical towards the United States. Uh, uh, and uh, how, how to measure the success well. of culinary diplomacy? Well, I, I, that's what I was saying earlier. You know, all of these initiatives are actually wonderful and it's a way of opening up. It's a way of opening your mind and expanding your mind and expanding not just your palate, but your understanding of things. And so on every level, that is excellent. But to take it to the next level where it will affect change that really does have to happen at, um, I mean, obviously it can't happen through Congress now <laughs> because nothing can happen. But, um, you know, if you have legislative bodies that can legislate things and there will be protests against it, but um, that's the incremental way. And I think that just, you know, with globalization for all of the terrible things it's wrought, it's also really opened people's minds to different um, ways of, of being. And I think that that is actually on balance, a really good thing. But no, I don't have the solution. I keep trying to. This is a kind of a silly sourdough question. Oh. My father learned to make sourdough bread when he was college age and uh, working in Alaska. Yeah. Last four, few decades, I'm in my mid teens. And he just went through this tear and he would make sourdough bread regularly. My question is, my recollection, and I still have a very clear recollection of the smell, but I recollect the bread being quite light, not dark. 
And yeah. I'm just wondering how the bread that you described uh, gets its darker characteristics. Oh, rye, rye flour as opposed to wheat. And um, uh, uh, it will be a brown bread. And if you want to be a really black bread, so um, people often add uh, caramel coloring to it. You can add um, some melted chocolate to it. You can add molasses to it. That won't be like this wonderful sourdough thing, but if you want like that pumpernickel dark thing, it usually has some kind of additive to it. But yes, the Alaskan sourdough, um, they had wheat and that's what they used. Okay. Thank you all so much. Thank you again. So let's, we are going to be finishing now. So let's, thank you so much. For this. This great. Class, and if you would like to ask some questions or like talk and meander, that's absolutely okay. Books are out there. Books, the books, yes, fine. please, your books are out there. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure what really cool. Let me just ask you a question. So, much so you have a club? Yeah, it focuses very specifically on <laughs> notionally. That's that's the one I was saying. Four days. Four days. I've been thinking about this. I put it down somewhere. <laughs> we have a small gift. Yeah, I'm so sorry. It's so funny that. Butcher mug and uh, a book from one of my colleagues yeah. has nothing to do with um, cooking or a culinary diplomacy, um, but it's about.